collaboration with the Cyprus Mail. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambos. Coming up on the programme this week, too many old diesel cars are on our roads impacting air quality in Cyprus. However, in Cyprus, we have around 300,000 cars circulating which have standards of non-EU regulations. They're from third countries, they're from Asia, from Japan, from Malaysia, from Singapore, from Indonesia, and these cars still have only two airbags on them. So forget the emission standards, they have non-existent emission standards in many cases. The EU Commissioner for the Digital Economy and Society says member states must work together to achieve a digital single market. And it's time to invest as a whole Europe, to invest in those new technologies that it's already clear that there is no member state that can tackle alone those challenges. And Finance Minister Haris Yordgiadis says the government must move ahead with what he termed a digital transformation that will positively impact the island's economic growth. Our policies here in Cyprus should now embrace innovation and digital transformation. This is an excellent way to improve our growth model and to broaden the productive base of our economy. I think globally there's probably a growing concern about the quality of the air that we all breathe. And although Cyprus is an island surrounded by sea, we too have our problems with air quality, particularly when there is, seems to be an increasing number of days where Saharan dust envelops the island and people are urged to buy those masks that stop them breathing in tiny particulate matter. But of course... Traffic and cars also contribute to the problem. We're joined on the programme this week by the managing director of Toyota Cyprus. Toyota, of course, one of the leaders in making cars that have either no emissions because they're all electric or they're hybrids. Dikranu Zunyan, thanks for coming along on the programme. Thank you, Rosie. Good night. And I'd like to ask you first about the way the market in Cyprus has moved because a few years ago nobody bought diesel cars here we didn't do enough mileage to make it financially viable but that changed a few years back didn't it and now we've got a lot of diesel cars a lot of old diesel cars let's make that clear which are very polluting so can you just talk us through where we are now but how we got here okay Rosie um, the markets developed tremendously uh, the automotive sector is going through tremendous change in the last few years, uh, as you know. And all this basically started uh, from the Dieselgate scandal a few years ago. Diesel has become an, an enormous issue. In Cyprus, up until about five years ago, the share of diesel was around 25 to 30 percent. But at the moment, it's shifted to over 50 or 60 percent of the market. Do you know why? This is being driven by lots of used imports of old cars, primarily from the UK market because the UK market, diesel market has collapsed by around 30%. Residual values have fallen dramatically and people are buying them and importing them in Cyprus. So in December last year, 78% of all passenger car registrations were used imports. So the numbers are actually shocking. And uh, so far, the government is unwilling to take any serious measures to, kept to tackle this problem. What measures would you like them to take? Well, obviously, there are quality measures that have to be, have to be uh, looked at because, unfortunately, these cars are coming in with only a very simple MOT test, so there's no emission testing done on these vehicles. But also, all governments throughout the world are looking at taxation. So, And we are too, because I spoke last year to the transport department head who was in the process of a public consultation to change the law so that road tax is calculated on emissions. Yes, I mean, uh, fair enough, uh, you're right to say that, but the measures being taken or proposed so far have really not been aggressive enough and whatever's been taken to the House committee before the legislature has been rejected because uh, the members of the House believe that uh, used cars should be uh, an option for many families in Cyprus, 
and they're concerned about any increase in the cost of these vehicles, which is understandable, but they're totally ignoring the dangers that we have with, with huge increases in emissions. And I, as I said, the, the issue now is not CO2. Uh, CO2 affects icebergs and the ozone, but as you said correctly, it's particulate matter in NOx. And everybody knows that the cars are the biggest factor to increasing NOx and particulate matter. And if you just wipe your hand on the cypress dust nowadays, it's no longer yellow, but it's black. And, and that is primarily because of these particulates. So you think that the legislation that is going before Parliament should be changed to say what? Well, the importer, I'm also on the importers, uh, car, New Car Importers Association, and we've obviously been lobbying to, uh, to try and promote the use and the sale of more friendly vehicles which are more friendly to the environment. So we have to look at the emission levels. We also have to look at the age of vehicles because the older they are, the more they emit. So we're proposing that the taxes are increased according to the age of the vehicle and the euro standards. And that's, so what, be an that's annual... what the legislation that I was told about last September was saying, exactly that. Yes, but unfortunately uh, the used car importers lobbied very hard against it and uh, when it went to the House, uh, they basically threw it back. So they're now refusing, it seems, to look at the age of vehicles, of used vehicles, but possibly according to their emission standards. But as you know, emission standards are changing almost every six months. So as new car importers, we're forced, as a European country, to import cars with the latest emission regulations. And not only emissions, safety regulations. However, in Cyprus, we have around 300,000 cars circulating, which have standards of non-EU regulations. They're from third countries, they're from Asia, from Japan, from Malaysia, from Singapore, from Indonesia, and these cars still have only two airbags on them. So forget the emission standards, they have non-existent emission standards in many cases. So it's a bit of a mess, and we need to really seriously tackle this. Wouldn't it help if the government took a hard look at a way to encourage people to buy hybrid and electric vehicles. I mean, we've never done that, but it might be part of the answer, might it, to put these cars within the reach of people who don't normally spend a lot of money and buy second hand. Of course, uh, that's a very good point, valid point. That, to be fair, the government has tried in the past, before 2013, they offered small incentives for the purchase of, of hybrid vehicles of around 300 to 500 euros. Uh, it doesn't go very far. It doesn't go very far. Hybrid the, vehicles are still very uh, expensive. Not very expensive anymore, Rosie. So they're at the price of a diesel now. So pricing levels of a hybrid, for example, our Toyotas and Lexuses, are approximately levels of diesels. So uh, a hybrid has become mainstream. And it, it's not only for Toyota, but every other manufacturer now realizes that they have to phase out their traditional and conventional engines like diesel and move into electrification of some form. So they'll move into hybrid, into plug-in hybrids, and eventually to full electrics. But we don't have the infrastructure. We don't have the infrastructure. So therefore, hybrids have a long way to go for the next uh, at least 10 to 15 years. Uh, but we also need to fully electrify. So for example, in our case at Toyota and Lexus, we expect to have full electric vehicles available in Cyprus by 2021. And where are people going to charge them? They'll charge them in their home. So plug-in hybrids, uh, will give you around 50 kilometer range. So, for example, use in the inner city for the week, your weekly needs will be more than adequate. Um, you'll plug it in on a home plug for eight hours, and, and that will give you the 50 kilometer range, but then it will convert to hybrid, and then you have no concern at all because it's self charging, of course. But to really get this off the ground, we need plug in stations available to the public in municipal car parks, in wherever else it happens to be, so that they can not just use electric in town, but they can drive to the other end of the island, for example. Of course, but if there's no policy to shift customers to lower emission vehicles and to electrification, then there's no point in setting up an infrastructure. Oh, so well, that's a bit why... chicken and egg, isn't it? Because it's... if you've got the infrastructure, people will say, OK, I can do this, so it's worth me looking at it. Whereas now a lot of them just say, I do a lot of travelling on the motorway, 
I really can't run out of steam, yes. as it were, before I get to Larnaca. I think all these issues have to be looked at very carefully. And, and obviously the infrastructure is, is, is one of the serious points. I mean, it's not enough having two points at the Larnaca airport and one in Nicosia. We seriously need to look at this. Maybe it doesn't need to be solved in 2019, but it has to be solved at least by 2020 and 21, because all car manufacturers have targets that we need to reach. We need to reach 95 grams CO2 for all our vehicle sales. This is a target, otherwise there'll be European penalties. But as I say, the problem is in Cyprus is we're not considering that. So the government is saying it doesn't matter that two out of 10 cars are new and eight are used, uh, and that's a major issue. What does the government say when you approach them as the importers, for example? Well, they seem to understand the problem, but nobody's willing to tackle it. So they understand that there's an emission problem now, and the government will be faced with severe penalties from the EU by 2021-22, because we'll miss our emission targets. So why don't they look ahead and spend the money that they will be paying in penalties on tackling the problem? Yes, I mean, and, and, and basically what is necessary is for them to shift some of that cost to the people who want to have higher emitting vehicles. So we're not saying ban vehicles, we're not saying stop the import of used vehicles from the UK. There's always, there will always be a market, there has to be free movement of trade between EU countries, but you need customers who are buying high emitting vehicles need to be taxed more. You keep talking about importing from the UK. There was a time when it was grey imports from Japan, but if most of these cars are coming from the UK, what's going to happen after March the 29th and Brexit? Nobody knows yet, Rosie. So we're not sure what the taxation, the tariff issue will be. We don't know if there'll be a special agreement. As the automotive industry, we hope that there will be some agreement with the UK because, as you know, many manufacturers are producing in the UK. We're importing cars from the UK, but we actually have no, no clue what will happen. And I think that probably goes as well for how we're going to be breathing cleaner air or perhaps not on the island for the coming years. We've been talking to the managing director of Toyota Cyprus, Dikran Uzunian. Listen online to the Cyprus News Digest on YouTube or at cypressmail.libsyn.com. The latest program is uploaded every Friday, and if you missed one, you can catch up there. The European Commissioner for the Digital Economy and Society, Maria Gabriel, was in Nicosia last week for a conference entitled The Digital Economy and Innovation. She told me afterwards what the main message was that she wanted to get across in her keynote speech. First, digital is everywhere, it's part of our daily life, but it's an opportunity for Europe to show very clearly that we have our strengths and we have our values. Our strengths, it's our researchers, it's our talented young people, it's our startups. Our values is the protection of personal data, it's the accountability, the responsibility. So now it's time first to act, to invest in our young people, in their digital skills, in their digital competencies, to support our active people, our small and medium enterprises, to support our European champions in order to give them the opportunity to use those perspectives. And it's time to invest as a whole Europe to invest in those new technologies that it's already clear that there is no member states that can tackle alone those challenges. It's advanced digital skills in cyber security, it's artificial intelligence, high performance computing and public administration and digital innovation hubs. But the problem is that with so many different member states, each with their own legislation, it must be a challenge for you to try and draw it all together into a single European block in terms of of what can be done in a digital economy. That's the objective of our digital single market strategy, to put an end of this actual fragmentation and to establish the digital single market in, in Europe. And we already have results, the end of roaming, the portability of content, the free flow of data, personal and non-personal, the end of the unjustified jail blocking. It's time now to continue. There is concrete deliverables for our citizens, for our staff. Startups. Now, if we have this huge market of 500 million Europeans, we'll, we give a chance 
to our researchers, to our talented people to stay in Europe, to our startups to grow and to scale up very quickly and to be unicorns and to say it very clearly to our international partners that for us values like the protection of personal data, the transparency, the responsibilities, that means something very important in this new world of technologies. How easy is it going to be for Europe to stay ahead of the game? There are huge economies out there across the world and we're all trying to get there first, aren't we? And we don't actually know where there is because new technologies are coming on all the time. It's true. New technologies are evolving so rapidly that nobody can tell where we'll be in five years. But, but we have already some strengths. We are strong in this invisible part of Internet, on chips, on security. Those questions are crucial for us. So we have to support our European champions. We are very strong on artificial intelligence. 25% of all robots all over the world are produced in Europe. But artificial intelligence, it's not only exponential growth of those technologies, it's about ethical questions. So that's the added value of our European approach. We have to work on blockchain and quantum technology in order to have transparency, trustability and innovation. The European Commissioner for the Digital Economy and Society, Maria Gabriel, who was in Nicosia last week. In collaboration with the Cyprus Mail, this is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambus. The biggest achievement of Crime Stoppers has been the ability of the public to be able to give information about crime anonymously. There's no way I could have kept prostituting without the drugs. There's no way I could have had my body used like a public toilet because that's actually what prostitution is. And then the fourth series I started three days after I'd won the Oscar. So the whole of the Monarch of the Glen experience was all interplatted with the Gosford Park Oscar experience. I was working with Ronnie James Dio and David was going to reform Whitesnake in 2003. Cyprus was chosen because Cyprus is a stable, peaceful and uh, secure place. We have to really look closely what are we doing with children, what are we doing with adolescents and what are we doing with adults that can help them move into a more literate uh, situation. The ones that I'm proudest of are the ones that were true discoveries where we found something we didn't know existed. Also addressing that conference on digital economy and innovation, the other keynote speaker was our finance minister, Haris Yorgiadis. This is what he had to say. There should be no doubt that the world is on the verge of a revolution. This, re this revolution will not be driven by ideology or by ethnicity or by religious beliefs. The new global forces will come in the form of artificial intelligence, big data algorithms, and bioengineering. It will be a revolution driven by technology. It will affect everyone, and it will be massive. For most of us, the talk of the new technological challenge may sound abstract, uh, too technical, too remote, and we have actually heard it before, at least since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. In fact, so far, technology has been the single most important force of positive change in our societies and our economies. It has helped pull millions out of severe poverty. It has uh, facilitated communication and exchange. It has raised the standards of healthcare and has enabled knowledge and reason to steer humanity ahead. Technology and automation has created over, over the years more jobs than the ones which were made redundant. 
but expert opinion converges and is convinced that the new wave of technological progress will be stronger and faster than anyone can imagine. However, this consensus breaks down when it comes to assessing whether the strides of the technology will continue to drive us in a positive direction or whether we <coughs> spiral out of control and become a force of destruction. Already there is speculation about the impact on the labor markets and in 20 or 30 years. Will technology keep creating new jobs as one would hope? Or will billions, will billions of people become economically redundant, driven out of their jobs by machines and our algorithm, algorithms, not, not merely unemployed, but unemployable? And under such circumstances, will the social and political repercussions remain manageable? Or are we on the verge of a resurgence in nationalism, entrenchment, and the futile defensive hostility to open markets and free trade? Ladies and gentlemen, I admit, I have, I have more questions than answers. In fact, I feel that politically and institutionally the world is still not fully prepared to handle this challenge. And this is exactly why I feel that it is imperative that we should intensify the political and the social dialogue in an effort to incorporate the technological challenge into a meaningful political narrative. In any case, a digital economy goes in hand with a digital society and with a digital democracy. This is exactly why this initiative of the Democratic Rally is both timely and commendable, Mr. President. But I would also highlight the importance of the presence of Commissioner Gabriel in this dialogue. Because I strongly believe that the challenges and opportunities which lie ahead highlight the role and the significance of the European Union. It is an illusion that the member states will be able to maximize the benefits <coughs> and the opportunities and to minimize the risks with a go-it-alone approach, no chance. We must work together at the EU level, removing barriers, ensuring access and connectivity, promoting e-society and investing in world-class ICT research and innovation. The new EU budget should be a tool in this direction. And what Stavriana mentioned, regulation, that's the key. It is imperative that we are able to design smart, efficient regulation, even of the ethical aspects relating to the technological revolution which is ahead of us. But also at the national level, efforts should be stepped up. Even countries which cannot hope to be leaders in the designing and developing of the new technologies should aim to be at the, forefront, at the forefront of using and utilizing the new technologies. And this is where I do see opportunities for Cyprus, having to a large extent surpassed, surpassed the legacy problems of the past. Our policies here in Cyprus should now embrace innovation and digi digital transformation. This is an excellent way to improve our growth model and to broaden the productive base of our economy. In this effort, we shall be relying 
on the advice and support of our academic, scientific and business community. In this direction, a new National Council for Research and Innovation has been established recently, and the first chief scientist of Cyprus has been officially appointed, as it happens just an hour ago. And I am delighted that both, both Professor Patsalis and the Chief Scientist Kiriakos Korkinos will be participating in the discussion which follows. During the year, we also aim to establish a post of a Deputy Minister for Digital Transformation to head a new integrated executive department. We have also taken a joint initiative with the Parliament, bringing, bringing in experts from the private sector and academia, but also all the relevant government agencies to draft a national strategy for the implementation of blockchain technologies. Our aim is to become one, to become one of the first countries to effectively regulate blockchain technology and to implement through a collaboration of the private and public sector pilot applications in the public sector as well as in the financial sector. We are also investing significant funds in a number of e-government projects in our public sector ranging from e-health, e-justice, the, uh, the application of digital signatures, the government, ERP, and so on. Dear Commissioner, ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by reiterating the commitment of our government, but also repeating a call that we should all engage in a substantial consultation, both at the national and EU level, in order to be ready, in order to effectively prepare our economies and societies for the new technological challenge which lies ahead of us. Thank you for your attention. Cyprus Finance Minister Haris Georgiadis speaking at that conference on the digital economy and innovation held in Nicosia last week. Listen online to the Cyprus News Digest on YouTube or at cypressmail.libsyn.com. The latest program is uploaded every Friday, and if you missed one, you can catch up there. And let's finish this week with a rare good news story for the environment. The Agriculture Ministry, which is also responsible for the environment, announced on Wednesday that fishing and the movement of boats have been prohibited in the Natura 2000 protected area of the Paya Sea Caves. You may recall, if you're a regular listener, that there was an outcry when developers were allowed to build on top of the sea caves. That, it seems, can't be undone. But the decree issued by the Ministry has been in effect since the 1st of February, according to which a core protection zone has been established, where fishing, as well as the movement and anchoring of ships, is strictly prohibited. The importance of the sea caves in Bea is that they are one of the last refuges of the endangered Mediterranean monk seal. It's one of the rarest of the 33 species of seals found in the world, and that's where they nest. They've had a couple of babies in the last couple of years, and that's important because there are only some 600 of the Mediterranean monk seal estimated to exist. The entire sea cave area is included in the Natura 2000 network, both as a site of community interest and a special protection area of the Akamas Peninsula. Well, that about wraps up this edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. Hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.